Hi, welcome back. The last session where I introduced value investing, I talked about three different ways in which you can be a value investor. The first I said is you could be a screener. The second I said you could be a contrarian investor. The third I said you could be an activist investor. And the screening approach I said was a passive approach. And I'd like to spend this session talking a little bit about screening in general and the kinds of screens that value investors have adopted, at least in very broad terms. So, as, I, as we said in the last session, tra scre screening goes back to Ben Graham or in, in his book, Security Analysis, and, in, and the variants thereof. He put together a bunch of screens that he used to find cheap stocks. And many of the screens you see, see today can trace their lineage back to what Ben Graham came up with as his basic screens for finding cheap stocks. So, broadly speaking, there are four groups of screens that you'll see used by value investors. The first are price-to-book ratio screens, and I'll talk a little bit about the intuition that drives the choice of this ratio and why people think buying low price-to-book ratios gives you cheap stocks, and then we'll look at the evidence. In fact, that's going to be a running theme through each of these screens is we'll look at the intuition and we'll look at the actual empirical evidence, and then we'll add some caveats, what can go wrong and maybe things you can check for. Second are price earnings ratio screens. Buy stocks with low PE ratios. This is actually a screen that Ben Graham suggested, but again, we'll look at how these screens have been updated, what the evidence looks like, and what to watch out for. Revenue multiples, relatively recent origin, because Ben Graham did not mention revenue multiples, but it, we'll talk about why investors have shifted towards revenue multiples, at least in some sectors. And again, what to watch out for and what the evidence looks like. And finally, dividend yields. For those investors who think of stocks as extensions of bonds, stocks with high dividend deals look like interesting stocks, and there are variations that, that seem, at least on paper, to have worked. For instance, one example of a dividend strategy is what's called the Dow Dogs. Pick the stocks in the Dow which have the highest dividend deals, and we're told that you can make more returns than the typical you know, investment in the market. So let's look at the intuition behind each of these approaches, the evidence, and what to watch out for. Let's start with price-to-book ratios. What's the intuition behind using a price-to-book ratio screen? Well, I think, again, it, it goes back to what you think about accounting. If you, if you trust accountants, at least to some extent, then book value actually means something, right? And in fact, there are people who argue that book value is a good proxy for liquidation value, that if you liquidate a company today, that what you see on the books is basically what you'll get. I wouldn't go that far, but there are some investors who actually buy into that notion. If you buy into that notion, buying a stock with a low price to book ratio, especially if the price is less than the book value, makes a lot of sense, right? Because then it looks like you're getting something for nothing. You buy the stock for less than the book value, you could at least in theory liquidate the company and get back more than you paid for the stock. Now we can debate the intuition, but let's look at the evidence. The evidence actually is interesting. It suggests that buying low price to book stocks is a winning strategy, at least across very long time periods. What you see on this graph is actually returns going back a long time, you know, going back all the way to the 1920s. And I've looked at returns by sub-periods and across the entire time period for stocks classified into 10 classes, 10 deciles, based on price to book ratios. from lowest price to book ratio stocks from high to highest price to book ratio stocks. Notice again, you don't need to do any statistical analysis to see that the lowest price to book stocks have earned higher returns than highest price to book stocks. These are without adjusting for risk. These are actual returns on an, an annual basis. So, and the reason I want to do that is I don't, want to, I don't want to be accused of somehow fixing the risk measure to make it look like low price to book stocks are better. Low price to book stocks earn higher raw, raw returns on an annual basis than the highest price to book stocks. Now there have been variants of these studies that have looked at excess returns, where excess returns they've tried to control for risk using betas or some traditional risk and return model. The evidence is actually pretty robust. The low price to book stocks still stay as the best investments relative to higher price to book ratios stocks. Well, so while the excess returns vary across the different time periods, across the time periods it's clear that low price to book stocks seem to have delivered higher returns. So does that mean you should go out and just buy low price to book stocks? Here are a couple of caveats. Now, now first if you look across international markets, it is true that for the most part across markets, low price to book stocks have earned a premium. So what this graph is, is the premium earned by low price to book stocks over high price to book stocks. It's the lowest decile versus the highest decile. 
So if, if you've seen the numbers that are above the line, those are positive premiums. So there are some markets where low price to book stocks have actually earned less returns than high price to book stocks. But across the markets, you can see that in most markets, low price to book stocks have earned a premium. The magnitude of the premium varies across time, varies across markets, but maybe the, the broad consensus conclusion you can draw from this is the evidence for low price to book stocks earning positive returns across high price to book stocks exists globally, but maybe it's not as strong as it is in the U.S. So if you take that collective evidence that low price to book stocks have historically seemed to have earned higher returns, what could explain those higher returns? Here are two things that might explain away the higher returns. And what I mean by explain away, it might mean that you buy these low price to book stocks thinking they're cheap, but they're really not cheap. There's something else going on. Farmer and French were among the first people to systematically lay out the fact that low price to book stocks on higher returns and high price to book stocks argued that the high returns persisted over such a long time period then it they, they couldn't really be you no know, excess returns because in the markets of ignoring something for a very long time period they argued that maybe low price to book stocks are riskier than high price to book stocks. Why? Because maybe they have more debt, they're more distressed, whatever. Whatever the reason is, there is an argument that can be made that maybe low price to book stocks earn higher returns, not because they're great investments, but because they're riskier. Again, I'm not suggesting this, this explains away things, but I'm saying maybe it's worth checking. The second factor is what kind of returns these companies are making. Because if you think about it, what goes in the book value is what companies collect from their investors as capital. They take that capital, they invest it in projects. If those projects are not good projects, you earn a low return on equity, your price is going to reflect that. In fact, if you go back and look at some of the sessions I've done on valuation, it's actually easy to show that if you have a stable company, a stable growth company, the price to book ratio is a function of two numbers, the return on equity and the cost of equity. And, and generally speaking, if the return equity is roughly equal to the cost of equity, you trade at book value. If the return equity is less than the cost of equity, if the return equity falls below the cost of equity, you trade at below book value. And if the return equity is higher than the cost of equity, you trade at above book value. So essentially, when you pick stocks with low price to book ratios, if they all end up having really low returns in equity, you might, have, might not be getting great investments. You might be getting companies that stay with low price to book ratios for a very long time period. So watch out for risk and watch out for terrible quality returns. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's look at PE ratios. Again, this, the intuition is very simple. When you buy a stock with a low PE, the argument is you're, you're, you're getting a lot for your money. You're, you're getting a much better bargain because you get a lot of earnings, you pay relatively low prices. That's the definition of a bargain, right? And again, if you look at the evidence over long time periods, and this again is PE ratios classified from highest PE to lowest PE, you can look, and, and this is for time periods from 1952 through 2010, you can see that now, that over the time periods, low PE stocks have historically delivered about 3, 4, 5 percent more than the rest of the market. Again, without adjusting for risk, it looks like low PE stocks have been good investments. Okay? Now, you could do this internationally, but rather than go there, let's think about what can, what can go wrong. Because again, while the international evidence also backs this up, low PE stocks seem to deliver higher returns. Here are three things to watch out for when you decide to adopt a strategy built around buying low PE stocks. First, check for the quality of the earnings. I mean, it sounds like a fancy thing, but you can buy a stock that looks cheap based on a PE ratio, but those earnings might be unsustainably high. Why? Because you might be buying a commodity, an oil company, in a year in which oil prices are really high, and if prices move back, your earnings are going to drop back. So look at the volatility in earnings. You're not just you don't want just to you don't want to just buy stocks with a low PE ratio. You want those earnings to be stable and sustainable. So you're looking for earnings that are stable rather than earnings that are unstable. So check for the quality of the earnings. Second, this is a side issue, but when you're an investor and you buy these low PE stocks, most of the time you also get much more tax liabilities going with that because these stocks tend to pay higher dividends, they have less price appreciation, and that might mean that you pay more in taxes. Again, a, a factor that you have to consider that might not wipe out your excess returns but might eat into your returns. And third, check for the fact that many companies with low PE ratios have very low growth rates or even negative growth rates. So you want to make sure that you get at least some growth with your low PE. You can't be unrealistic and say, I want 50% growth. You're not going to get that, but you want to get some growth. 
with your PE. So check for risk, check for taxes, check for growth. Again, not with the intent of wiping out the entire list of low PE stocks, but to find the best of those stocks. Now, in the last three decades especially, people have looked at other variants of earnings. People have shifted away from price earnings ratios to looking at other earnings multiples. One very widely used multiple is enterprise value to EBITDA. What's that? Enterprise value is just not is not just the market value of equity. It's the market value of de equity plus debt minus cash. You're saying, what is that measuring? It's a rough measure of the market value of the operating assets of the company. EBITDA, of course, is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, a rough measure of operating cash flow. And there are people who argue that this multiple is actually better than e price earnings because it captures the entire capital structure of the company, not just the equity slice. And that has pluses and minuses because in, in return for having a more comprehensive measure of value, you're also moving up the income statement to a measure of earnings or a measure of cash flow that might not be a realistic number. What I mean by that is you as an equity investor in a company c cannot lay claim on the EBITDA. For, from that, you've got to play CapEx and working capital. You've got to make debt payments, and only what's left over comes to you. Lots of companies with great-looking EBITDA where you as an equity investor will get nothing as cash flows at the end. So watch out for that EBITDA number. It can be too broad a number, not quite capture the true, it might not be a measure of cash flow to you as an investor. And check for growth and risk, just as we did with price earnings ratios, because when you buy low EV to EBITDA companies, you might be getting low growth and high risk companies, neither of which is particularly desirable. So those are earnings multiples. Revenue multiples. Starting about three decades ago, you started to see investors move to revenue multiples for a couple of reasons. One is both book value and accounting earnings or accounting numbers. And to the degree that you trust accountants less and less, you're going to move up the income statement to the top line. So revenues, of course, are it's not that they're not affected by accounting judgments, but they're less affected. So people started looking at revenue multiples. There was another reason. There are entire sectors, especially of young companies, you know, technology companies in the 80s, dot-com companies in the 90s, social media companies in the last three years, where you might not make much money or you might be losing money, but you could still be a promising company. There you can still use revenue multiples, even though you can't use earnings or book value multiples. So revenue multiples have kind of got, got a little bit of a foothold. The evidence of revenue multiples is not as clean or as comprehensive as the, uh, the evidence on PE ratios and price to book ratios. Put differently, there is not strong evidence or no, no strong evidence going back in time that companies with low revenue multiples have generated higher returns than companies with high revenue multiples. There are studies that seem to show that, but there are also contrary studies, studies that seem to show that that doesn't hold. But there are people who hold on to revenue multiples. And as with price earnings ratios and price to book ratios, look for what can go wrong. A lot of companies that look cheap on a price to sales basis, which often is the multiple that many analysts use, especially in technology, market value of equity divided by revenues, might have high leverage. They have a lot of debt. They can look cheap because you're focusing just on the equity portion of the value. Revenues basically have to cover everything, not just the equity. The other, of course, is margins. Lots of companies with low revenue multiple tra that trade at low multiples of revenues often have terrible margins. Grocery stores trade at low multiples of revenues; they deserve to trade at low multiples of revenues. There are high brand, uh, there are great brand name companies that trade at high multiples of revenues; they deserve to trade at high multiples of revenues. So, in a sense, check the margins because the margins can often explain why some companies look cheap on a revenue multiple basis. So, we've looked at price to price to book, price earning, or earnings multiples, book value multiples, revenue multiples. The last set of multiples are dividend yield multiples. And there are value investors who are wedded to dividend yields. They love buying stocks with high dividend yields. But here the evidence is fairly mixed. In fact, if you look at this graph and you compare it to the price earnings and the price to book ratio graphs, you can see the contrast which is, this is a graph that looks as lowest to highest dividend yield stocks and actually looks at non-dividend pays as a separate group because that's a pretty large group. And you can see that there is little evidence, especially across long time periods, that the highest dividend yield stocks have done better than the rest of the market. I know, I know there are people who argue that if you buy just the highest dividend yield stocks in the Dow, the Dow dog strategy could have made money. But again, the, the overall evidence on high dividend yield stocks is not that promising. And I think there's a reason why that is, which is when you buy stocks with the highest dividend yields, you often get a 
you know, some some on, some stocks in there that you would not want in your portfolio. And here are some of the things to watch out for when you just pick stocks based on high dividend yields. The stocks with the highest dividend yields are often are stocks that cannot afford to keep paying those dividends over time. So they have high dividend yields, and so you buy them based on that, but those dividends don't continue. Remember, dividends are not like coupons on bonds. You can't contractually claim them. So if a company stops paying dividends, you can't sue the company. You can, but you're not going to get the dividends. So check for unsustainable dividends. You say, how the heck am I going to do that? Not that difficult. When we talked about valuation, I introduced the notion of free cash flow equity of potential dividend. Cash flow left over after you met every conceivable need. So the next time you find a stock with a 5% dividend, dividend yield, check to see whether its free cash flow to equity can serve as the dividend. If it cannot, you know the 5% dividend yield is not going to last. So check for unsustainable dividends because if a company is borrowing money to pay the dividends, selling assets to pay the dividends, neither can be sustained over time. Second, check for low or even negative growth. You can get a high dividend yield, but if you have a company that's liquidating itself over time, you're getting a liquidating dividend. You're not getting a continuing dividend. So check for low or negative growth. And third, check for taxes. Not so much because the tax rate on dividends is higher than the tax rate on capital gains. That might, they might be set to the same, but because when you receive dividends, you have to pay taxes when you receive them. Whereas if it's price appreciation, you can choose when to pay taxes because you don't have to pay taxes until you sell the stock. So there might be a tax liability issue. So overall, the dividend yield strategy doesn't look good on paper, but if you really find a dividend yield strategy that seems to work, check for the fact that dividends might not be sustainable for low growth and potentially tax libraries. So value investors do know this. So when they invest in these stocks based on low PE, low price, they try to protect themselves. And as part of the protective armor, there are three things that, they, um, that I've seen value investors do. One is, what I call accounting checks. In other words, they take the accounting numbers, but rather than use the accounting numbers as is, they use one of three variants. The first is what I call normalized earnings, which instead of using the earnings in the most recent year, they use an average earnings across time. Works great for commodity and cyclical companies to capture that volatility in earnings over time. The second is they adjust the earnings for what they feel are items that should not be in there. So there are services that actually take the earnings reported by companies and adjust them for investors. Make them more consistent so you can compare across companies. You don't end up buying the most aggressive companies rather than the cheapest companies. And in the last session, I talked about Warren Buffett's way of computing owner's earnings, which is earnings left over after CapEx. Essentially, you're saying if, if, an, if a company's earnings are going to go back into the business, I can't claim them. So you're looking for a measure of cash earnings rather than actual earnings. All ways of checking for that denominator if you're using an earnings multiple. You could do the same thing with book value, kind of normalize, clean up, use a measure of book value that you think is more reliable. In fact, there are people who use tangible book value versus total book value. The difference being that if a portion of your book value comes from goodwill or other intangible assets, they take them out saying, if I liquidate the company, I'm not going to lay claim on that. And that's a pretty sensible thing to do. So the first set of uh, protective armor is to do the accounting checks because you are in the denominator using an accounting number when you use earnings or book value. The second is what I, I mean, and this is a big term used by value investors, is the moat. What the moat refers to is the, is the fact that you need to earn more than your cost of equity or cost of capital to be worth a lot. So when you see a company with a low price to book, we talked about many of these companies earning less than their cost of equity. So what you'd like actually is a company that traded at a low price to book but has the capacity to earn well above its cost of equity. What determines that? What kind of competitive advantages do you have? What are your barriers to entry? That's what the moat measures is the magnitude of your barriers to entry. So what you want is a company that looks cheap that has a significant moat that allows it to continue to earn more than its cost of equity or capital over time. And the third approach is an approach that we talked about in the context of risk measure, which is the margin of safety, which is you want to buy stocks that are not just cheap, but are 30% cheap or 40. So there's some basis below which you knock the value. So you say, I will buy a stock only if it falls 20, 30, 40% below what I think is its reasonable value. All ways in which you're trying to protect yourself. It's not going to always work, but some ways in which you're trying to protect yourself against finding companies that look cheap, but that are not really cheap. So if you're going to screen, if you're going to be a passive screener, I have a four-step process that I think you should try. And here's the first step. 
use some kind of earnings, you know, price earnings, price to book, EV to EBITDA. So start with a multiple to find cheap stocks. So what I'm assuming is you have access to some kind of big data set, and most of us do. It's in, in fact, it's available for free online in many places, Yahoo Finance, for instance. But if you're willing to pay money, you can get an even larger, more comprehensive data set. So I'm assuming you have access to a data set. Start with a pricing multiple. So as an example, you might say, I want to find all companies trading at a PE less than 10. So let's say you find 1,000 companies out of 7,000 come in. Second, you want to co find companies that have low risk. And you're not constrained to use my measures of risk. You don't have to use beta or standard deviation. You can use your definition, your variation on risk to screen for low risk. So your low risk measure might be, I want to find companies where earnings have been stable over time. So that's the second screen. So out of the thousand companies low PE, you might find 250 which have had stable earnings. So now you have 250 companies which had a PE less than 10 and stable earnings. Okay? The third step in the process is you want to get at least some growth. So don't get unrealistic. Don't say, I want companies with more than 50% growth because nothing's going to come through. But you might say, look, I want companies which have grown at more than 10% or are expected to grow more than 10%. And that's a choice you can make. You can either look at historical growth or analyst projections of growth. So at this stage, out of the 250 companies, let's say 65 have growth rates greater than 10%. So these 65 now have PE ratios less than 10, stable earnings, and growth rates greater than 10%. Then you want to find companies with high quality growth. In other words, you want them to be able to generate, generate this growth without reinvesting more. You might say, look, I want to find companies which have returns on equity that exceed 20%. So out of the 65, only 25 might show up. But remember, 25 companies is a lot of companies still for you to invest in. So you might start with 4,000 companies and end up with 25, but you're looking for the ultimate mismatch. You want a cheap company with low risk, with high growth, and high quality growth. You're saying, what chance do I have of finding something like that? No harm looking. That's the essence of screening. So when you think about being a passive screener, here are some of the things that I think will set you apart. First is screening. If you look at all those studies that I've quoted, they look at long time horizon. So for screening to work, you need a long time horizon. You need to pick your screens well. We talked about the four-step approach. Try different ones. Look at history. There's lots of data out there, and that's why it's so critical that you pick your screens well. Third, be diversified. Okay? The, there are a lot of value investors who seem to view this as an either or. Either I can be a value investor or be diversified. I don't see why. So if you end up with 25 stocks on the previous page as companies coming through, check to see that they're across the spectrum, that you don't end up with 25 manufacturing companies. You want some technology companies, some manufacturing companies, some service companies, a couple of banks. Because the more diversified you get, the more you've spread your bets. Watch out for taxes and transactions costs. So in other words, check that, that final list of 25 companies to make sure that you don't end up with a disproportionately large number of companies which trade at less than $2. Why is that significant? Because remember, low price stocks have much higher transactions costs. So check and make sure that you are, in fact, going to make money in your actual portfolio, not just on paper. So passive screening, if you look across the spectrum, in a sense, is a carryover from those original 10 screens from Ben Graham. There are, you can have book value screens or earnings screens or revenue screens or even dividend screens. Just remember to think through the intuition of why you think that screen will work. And then dot your I's and cross your T's. Check for risk, check for growth, check for quality of growth. Because you want to make sure that you're ending up with really cheap companies that are cheap, not just companies that look cheap. That's about it. Thank you very much for listening.